Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Bingo, we're back. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, beginning another broadcast week. Wow, yeah. it gets better and better. Brett Obergard, <laughs> <laughs> he's in the faculty at the uh, journalism program at the School of Communications at UH Manoa, comes down to talk to us from time to time about, about very important issues relating to journalism um, to try to help us understand not only journalism, but it, it, you know the sources and effects of journalism. So, because we, we engage with journalism, they are us and we are them, right? Right, mm -hmm. Brett? Yes, we're all intertwined. And, uh, you know, advertising, public relations, journalism, it's all in a mix. And we have to tease out what we want of, of our communication. So we have a couple, of, uh, a couple of topics today. The first one being the MIT study mm -hmm. reported in the paper, um, in the New York Times, I know, a couple of days ago, um, you know, on when people are more likely to accept and pass on fake news. This is really interesting. So, you know, you've thought about this question. What, for that discussion, for that analysis, what is fake news? It's not an easy question. <laughs> what is fake news? Well, I would argue any, uh, any part of any story that's not true makes the entire thing fake. Okay. So you'll find uh, what we've discovered in, in research about fake news is that these Russian uh, bots will actually scoop up a bunch of real news and circulate that as well to mix with their fake news. So they give this appearance that, yes, we're a legitimate channel, and then they will take these uh, real stories and change a couple words or add a couple sentences right in the middle of it. So it's very, very difficult to figure out what's fake and what's not. But as a baseline definition, I'd say if there's one fake word in a piece, then it's fake news. Well, that, and that, you know, looking at it from the reader's point of view, and I have had this experience, I'm sure you have too, I'm reading something that appears to be legit. Mm -hmm. They got my email address from somewhere, they send me some stuff. Maybe more than once, maybe daily. But I'm looking at it and, you know, it seems to be legit. It seems to comport with other news. And then there's a clunker. Yeah. Right in the middle of it, there's a mm -hmm. clunker. And I say, well, let me look at that again. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can identify that as fake news. And if I can, actually, Brett, I make the same analysis you were talking about. Well, if the one sandwiched among the good ones is fake news, I have to question all of them. And if I have to question all of them, I'm not taking that email anymore. Right. And this is the worst in social media because your friends uh, provide you with these stories. They think they're real. Uh, so they add a layer of credibility to it that you don't get um, just from direct contact with the media source. Right. And plus, you lose the origin of where the story came from. Right. You know, did it come from the Denver Guardian, which is a fake uh, site that's meant to represent, you the know, Denver like the Guardian. Denver Post or something. <laughs> and it looks completely real. You look at it on the website, uh, and, and if you're not paying attention, if you're not being vigilant, if you're not doing your, um, you know, citizenry type work, then you easily can be misled. Well, what about a site? I, maybe there is a site like this. I just wouldn't know about it. <clears throat> maybe there's a site that identifies the Denver Guardian and others like that that are, you know, fake. Uh, what, what about that site identifying stories that are sandwiched in that are fake? Um, <clears throat> I mean, my, my problem is I'm not sure I believe <laughs> the site that claims to be able to identify fake news. But let's assume, you know, there is a certain amount of credibility on that site. Wouldn't that be helpful? to have somebody come up and, and tell me where the bad guys are? Oh, well, it would be, but uh, you imagine how daunting of a job that would be when yeah, yeah. E any person in any place at any time could change one sentence in any story and recirculate it. It's, how are you going to do that? It's yeah. really, I don't believe a technological solution exists. I think it's a human uh, awareness and literacy problem. And yeah. until people... Um, really take charge of their information again and, and become responsible for it, then we're going to have this misinformation and disinformation everywhere. Let me, let me offer and a then, thought on that last. You said there's no technological solution right now, but there might be. You know, artificial intelligence is, by definition, pretty smart. And maybe you could program artificial intelligence to spot the clunkers and notify you. Um, and it would be dynamic. It would be every day. It would be every story that it comes around, or better yet, be every story that comes to you. Yeah. So it said, wait, Jay, there's a clunker here. <laughs> yeah. What about that? 
Uh, I, I, I would recommend we don't put faith in machines and algorithms <laughs> because somebody has to write the program. Now, artificial intelligence by nature does learn from its own mistakes, but what is it learning and, and how is that benefit to humanity? That's a big question that yeah, I don't yeah. think we really have uh, an answer for. And we d also don't have any guarantees that the machines are going to say the best interest of of us is to make these humans and not know fake news. <laughs> That's a pretty bleak picture you're painting, Brett. I mean, it's bleak for all of us, really. But it gets bleaker. It gets worse <laughs> well, yeah. with this MIT study. Can you talk yeah. about what it, what it said? Well, the uh, summary of it would be basically that um, fake news travels much faster, much deeper than real news. And it's not the computers that are doing it, it's the other human beings in the system that are um, sharing with their friends or retweeting or whatever. And they're, um, they're circulating this information as true, giving it a, they're vouching for its credibility. Like if I share something with you, then you think, oh, Brett shared this with me, so it must be true. It gives you, it let, lets you put your guard down and the fake information does its job. But sometimes fake news, arguably, is pretty, is pretty believable. I mean, it, it, I think a lot of well, fake news is yeah. close, close to the truth, but not quite. <clears throat> and so um, if, if somebody as a credible source, or reasonably credible, a peer group credible source, my high school classmate, for example, um, tells me that, you know, he got this or implies he got this from a good source, I, I'm likely to believe it and not know, and not know that it's fake. This is very troublesome. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, it reminds me of a story one of my graduate school uh, professors told me about an experiment he did. He studied rhetoric, and he would walk around the halls of, of the university saying, uh, I read a story in the New York Times yesterday about how raisins cured, cured cancer. And if everybody ate more raisins, they would, you know, <laughs> there would be no more cancer. And he would just see what people would say. And, <laughs> Almost every time, people would say, oh my gosh, really? I'm going to get some more raisins. You know, they would never question it. Here's an authority figure dropping down the second authority with the New York Times and, you know, some sure. kind of uh, healthy-sounding snack. You know, it just all works. Sure. And, it comes together. Yeah, You've it comes together. you pieces of it before. Yeah. And it's people this... want to believe uh, those types of things. They yeah. don't want to believe that um, we're out of control as you know we're out of control of the world the world's chaotic when we can't like save save people from cancer they want to believe we can do it they want to believe that we can stop war we can stop uh, all sorts of injustice and the reality is we're, we're in a very chaotic world and without this clear uh, truthful type of uh, public discourse we're really in trouble public discourse <clears throat> I want to get to that but one one thing first is that you know we both mentioned the New York Times so if my, my classmate in high school says to me, I saw this in the New York Times, high credibility, absolutely high credibility. More and more, the New York Times is a leader in this uh, sort of truth giving. Um, but how do I know that what he said about the New York Times is true? He may have that all wrong, intentionally or otherwise. I have to go and look at the New York Times. And a lot of people see the New York Times as the oracle, but they don't read it. Right, they so read the headline or subhead or something. Yeah. So I mean, this creates an, another problem in terms of the credibility aspect. I, well, I, I believe what he said, but... You know. Well, and we have to look like, why do we trust the New York Times? And the reason we, we trust it is because they have a process in place that is trustworthy. And very few people have that, that level of a, a system in place in, in the media. And they have maybe one of the most refined systems where, you know, they have probably 10 editors that look at a story before it, it appears on their um, publication. They, they have fact checkers for every fact. And um, they have, you know, a lot of discussions about what we include, what we don't include. And if, and if, if there's some request for a clarification or a correction, they have a vetting process for that, that that is quite extensive and timeless in the sense that they have corrected errors made 100 years ago. You know, if they become aware of it and they look back at their coverage and they say it's wrong, they'll write a correction. And it's that process that makes it believable to us, not necessarily any, any individual at the New York Times or any, um, you know, publisher or anything like that. It's because of the, the system they have in place that they've earned that trust. Yeah, and they have a, quote, public editor. They have a public editor. Who represents the readers and writes about the paper 
mm -hmm. about that process that you described. It's very right. interesting. Yeah. Not everybody has this kind of controls on the truth. Hardly anyone does anymore. Yeah. There's, there's, I think there's only five public editors in the country now. And uh, uh, one thing I've noticed about the media in Hawaii is it's very um, closed. It's a very closed system. They're not transparent about virtually everything they do. And I think, you know, there's reasons to be skeptical of people like that. You can't take people's word for, for it that they're going to do what's right if they don't show you that they're doing what's right. Yeah. And that transparency is uh, the key to the, the whole issue, I think. So going, going back to the question of um, the speed at which fake news travels and the, what do you want to call it, the coefficient <laughs> of distribution, if you will, um, you know, this is fascinating, and I was telling you before the show, I, I see journalism these days and the response to journalism, in fact, everything around journalism, as a study of sociology and psychology, of mass psychology. Um, we have never had um, this kind of distribution of information the way we have it now. And it moves people. It moves political forces. It moves the economy. So it's all the more important that we get it right, because it could move us easily in the wrong, and it does. Look what happened in the election, we gotta talk about that. But why, why does fake news travel faster? Why are people more, um, more likely to, to repeat fake news than regular news? This is very chilling. And, and um, why do they move it, you know, why do they move it in the first place, and why do they move it faster? Two questions. Well, I, I can't say uh, definitively why, but what I can say is that when you have information that, that's less tied to facts, it becomes more emotional. And I think the effective response of the information is what's pushing it. So uh, if you hear a piece of information that's salacious, you're more likely to say, oh my gosh, you know, no, I guess what I know, because it's, there's some emotional uh, impact to you that something you know, bad is happening or something untoward or something you know, dishonest or, or whatever it is. And you want to spread that information uh, so other people know about it. The problem is if it's not true, then you're, then you're really, uh, as the Russians call people, the useful idiot. You're running around telling people misinformation that you believe is true, but it's really not true. So you're being useful to the, the propagandists or, or or misinformation. Yeah, folks. Yeah. yeah, and you do that because you do that because I, I'm really it's, it's worth a moment to dwell on the on the word salacious. I certainly agree. Raw meat news travels faster because you know it appeals to uh, some base baser intellectual process. Um, it's the kind of thing you want to repeat as gossip. It's when you send it to your friend, you're saying, whoa, you really want to hear about this one. <laughs> yeah, well, it's all pathos, you know, and uh, when you study argumentation or rhetoric, there's basically three uh, legs that rhetoric stands on. You have the ethos of a person, which is their, their character and credibility. You have the logos of the argument, you know, the facts and how they stack together, and then you have the pathos of, uh, you know, the emotions of it all. You know, how, do, how do you do emotional, emotional appeals? Yeah. And, and basically, fake news is all geared toward uh, pathos because. Well, could it not be? I mean, for example, economic report says the market went up 200, when in fact the market went down 100. That's not an emotional. Well, for some people, it is. Well, that but this, that's easy to check. It if is, you, yeah. yeah, if you say you know President Trump is having an, a f multiple affairs with porn stars. That's and, salacious. Yeah, and you, <laughs> you know, how 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 would you check that? It's going to be, you know, he said, she said, or whatever. And then it's very emotional because it, it really cuts to the core of the morality of, of our country's top office. Why? What is it about human psychology that makes us want to glom on to salacious news, want to glom on to that? You know, I mean, I think it's almost, let me throw a, a theory at you. Okay. <clears throat> it's, it's not for me so much. It's for my friends that I'm going to distribute this. It's, I, I want to give them a a gift. I want to give them something they don't know, that they never expected. I want them to have the gift so that they can give it to their friends, too. Mm -hmm. I want to, you know, raise the buzz somehow. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing my friends a favor. And I, and I feel this in my own self when I do forward an article or something. I'm, I'm not going to forward every article. I'm not going to forward stuff that's boring. Yeah. I'm going to forward stuff that's hot. All right. And I usually... People are going to talk about... Yeah, right. Yeah, because that builds your uh, esteem in the community. 
Yeah. You know, you're the person breaking this news. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to forward a city council agenda with a budget, right? <laughs> And then you have you have the ethos and the and the logos of the of the work, but you don't have any pathos, so uh, you end up with um, you end up with a, a real uh, orientation toward emotional, effective news. Yeah, yeah, it's very dangerous for society. You can't operate that way. You, you need a, a more measured, well, we're also, measured intellectual analysis of it. And we're also uh, this is a way that we have been put at each other's throats. You know, you pick the most emotional issue, and you fuel each side of it, and it makes something that was, you know, potentially solvable into unsolvable, and it makes something unsolvable into a death match. Yeah, I, I want to talk about that right after this break. I want to talk about a couple of things that have sprung out of what you said so far. That's okay. Brett Opergard. He's the uh, faculty uh, at um, uh, the uh, journalism program at the uh, School of Communications at UH Manoa. Mm -hmm. Comes down and talk to us. And I really enjoy these conversations. We'll be right back. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 AM. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just kind of scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons, and then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up, and please follow us we're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We couldn't wait to get back. <laughs> I'm, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters. This is Brett Obergaard from the, the journalism program at the School of Communications, UH Manoa. So um, one of the couple of things that sprung out of what you were talking about before, one, one is, um, you know, one prescription, Rx, so to speak, for, for this emotional pathos kind of uh, social reaction, and I mean on a large scale social reaction, is that people should talk to each other like they did in the days of Abe Lincoln, where they sat around the, the, the you know, the, the, the hygienic store. <laughs> <laughs> had conversations, yeah. and one guy would say, did you see that thing? And the other guy would say, I don't believe it. Or he would say, did you check it out? Do you know something about that? And as a result, you get a human kind of engagement test on whether this is right or wrong. I mean, how would that work in the 21st century? Well, I would start uh, by getting a, a story on Facebook that you, you find uh, salacious or, or you want to you wanna send it, but you... It, you know, like when you're mad and you say, I'm going to take 10 seconds and I'm not going to talk. Take, take uh, 10 minutes and don't re-forward your list. <laughs> right. And then, uh, you know, I recommend finding someone outside of your bubble and saying, did you hear about this story? What do you think of it? And see if it matches their perception of it or their take on it. And then you can kind of find in the middle what really happened. So uh, to immediately forward the story among your bubble and incite more rage and hate uh, instantaneously, what do you get out of that? That's what I wonder. It's like, what, what do you really gain? Well, you get gratification. You get, well, okay, you maybe a little a favor, bit. You get everybody excited. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you get energy, but yeah. it's not good energy. It's, yeah. it's negative, destructive energy. And uh, when, when you could be like a voice of reason, that could be the... the the choice you make that I'm going to take just 10 minutes, you know, or 20 minutes yeah. or whatever, or even a day to sit on this one and think about, is it true? Yeah. And then what, what do I really make of it? And, yeah. and have a, a reasoned, rational response instead of, you know, look at look what these stupid people are doing again. Right, right, because you enhance it yeah. when, you, when you make a, you a, an affirmative it. comment that suggests it's true. Yeah. yeah, you amplify it, and that's that's the, in the social media tech world they call it amplification, and they want to amplify all their content up until it drowns out everything else. This so, is part of that 
part of that same thing with the social psychology. Yeah. The amplification part. And, but, the, and the scary part about, to me, the scariest part is these social media companies have created a monster that they have lost control of. There's nothing Facebook or Twitter can do right now to stop this Frankenstein's monster that's walking around, you know, crushing everything in its path. Yeah. Unless they can just turn the whole thing off, and they're not going to do that. No, so the market has too much money. And yeah, much I mean, they and if they start to squelch conversation or squelch, uh, uh, you know, whatever circles are are in their in their um, platform, then what has already been shown is that people go to alternative platforms that are even more hate-filled, even more mm. um, partisan, even even less cr uh, credible. Which, if that's possible. You know, they go into these even worse uh, circles and works, worse types of um, social media companies that are basically taking the, the drift off of Facebook and Twitter, and they're supporting it to try to get an audience, but then the audience is even worse than the, it's like condensed version of the worst of Facebook or Twitter. So it's, a, it's a, just a, a disaster. Suppose, back to my artificial intelligence possibility, <clears throat> suppose on Facebook, and with various you know, artificial intelligence uh, analysis, I create a rating system based on the source of the information, the likelihood, possibility that it's in conflict with other news and all that. You know, with social networking analysis, I'm just looking at keywords like, like they do in Washington, you know, in the basement. Um, you, can, you can find out a lot about text, what the text is saying. And so suppose they came up with a rating Sort of like the ratings for a seller in, in eBay, mm -hmm. or the ratings for a product on B&H Photo, mm -hmm. uh, or Amazon itself. Um, I'm much more likely to buy a product, or stay at a hotel, or take an airline that has a five-star rating than a one-star, or a two-star, or even a three-star rating. I want the highest possible rating. So if they did that, and, and granted, it wouldn't necessarily be completely accurate, but if they gave me ratings and stars like that, based on whatever analysis they could provide, that would have, that would affect my likelihood of transmitting this with a, you know, with a with a reinforcing um, what you call an ex expansion um, uh, expansion comment yeah. to suggest to somebody amplifying, somewhat amplifying yeah. mm -hmm. comment to suggest that that he should listen to it. What about that? Well, it reminds me of the experience I had a couple years ago when I was in a new place and I wanted to go to a restaurant. And so I typed in the type of food I wanted and there were a bunch of reviews, like five star, blah, blah, blah. And I went to the restaurant. It was by far one of the worst places I'd ever been. I mean, it was, a, it was claimed to be a five star, uh, uh, you know, Asian fusion mix of cuisine, right? I get in, it's a buffet table with like the ice cream machine broken, squirting ice cream all oh, over the place. So I don't mention the, that. You know, I, don't, I have zero faith in these uh, reviews because they've been rigged. Um, they've been rigged, just like sure, social when media. Somebody's paying money. It's a problem. Well, they, it's like they have they have trolls it's, it's for everything. They have trolls for restaurants that you know that they pay people wherever and yeah. they say you know write a hundred positive reviews about this place right sure. for a for hundred bucks and then they get so uh, I, I don't have any faith in that kind of system and then even the, even the most fundamental part of that argument is okay you have New York Times Fox News what's gonna get the five rating and why and then you're gonna have to debate that with all the people that watch Fox News or New York Times and they're not gonna agree they're gonna be in their bubbles about it and it's just not it's just not gonna go anywhere so I'll tell you a short story on, on January was the 13th of Saturday when we had the false alarm mm -hmm. and my wife and I are sitting there and the phone rings and the false alarm so we go into a protected part of our house because why not and we bring our puppy with us <laughs> okay and now we've done really all we can do to respond to the false alarm so I call my brother my brother's on the mainland. He's a fair witness. He's not here. There's no emotional lay for him, layover for him. Um, <clears throat> and I say, you know, this is what we got on the phone. What do you think? Do you think that it, what is the probability this could be true? And I mean, he's a smart guy anyway, he's a college professor, law school professor. Um, and he, it didn't take him one second to say that doesn't compute. This false alarm does not compute. Everything that he knows in the world. It's not consistent. And the point is, you know, he's 6,000 miles away. 
The point is, he's a smart guy, and he's going to give me a straight answer. Um, so I think it's part of what you were saying before about this, this need to have a, a trusted group, a trusted friend who you can bounce it off, who is more likely, and who is at some distance, really, who is more likely to be able to make a good analysis. Well, and it also talks about, it also uh, directly hits on the emotional part of it. Like on January 13th, when we got the missile alert at my household, you know, my wife uh, received it and was very concerned and almost a panic. My children are crying. We're trying to escape. You know, so there's all there's no time for rational thought. Yeah, it's a it's a survival moment. Yeah, yeah. And there was, I, I mean, if I was by myself, maybe I would have sat down and rationally searched and tried to figure out, well, why are the sirens going or whatever. Yeah. But when you have this uh, group of people. Hearing the same news as you, it seems believable because yeah. we've been told that it's believable yeah. by our own trusted government. Yeah. And uh, w w I mean, what are we expected to do? Not panic? I don't think so. This is like uh, the, you know you're just about to be incinerated. Yeah. You have, well, one you have guy put his children minutes. down a manhole. Oh, there's all sorts of stories <laughs> about things that happened during that time. You know, I heard it. Well, anyway, I heard a lot of uh, really disturbing stories about what happened during that yeah, time yeah. period. And it reminded me of the War of the Worlds uh, broadcast by Orson sure, Welles, sure, where sure. there was a new medium, the radio, in the, in, in the time of, the, of this broadcast. And people heard the story. They thought it was true. They, they, it caused an incredible chaos. And it's the same thing with mobile technology. It's a new technology that we haven't quite figured out. We're not accustomed to it. And we assume that if somebody sends us a message saying a, a ballistic missile is going to hit us at any moment from our government and sends us this message, then we should believe it. And that's a dangerous thing to not believe. We have no, right, dangerous not to believe. We yeah. have no way of verifying. We have no way of verifying. We get a text message. We have, we have a minute left. I want to ask you one <clears throat> other thing. Okay. <clears throat> and, um, and, that, and that goes to the Russians. We spoke about them. So the Russians uh, in P St. Petersburg, those young kids, write copy, American, you know, in English language, and this somehow gets distributed in the U.S. to, you know, targeted areas and groups and, and social media channels, and, uh, and there's false news in there, and the news is intended to make bubbles, make controversy, create, um, you know, dissension, and, uh, and, and affect a, an election, and I, I really believe they did. Um, so, you know, the, the question I put to you is, what is the difference between those guys in St. Petersburg and some guy in St. Petersburg, Florida, who does exactly the same thing? He wants to affect an election. He wants to affect public opinion. He wants to create bubbles and dissension and controversy. I mean, isn't that possible? And maybe isn't it happening anyway? What's the difference? Well, I don't think there's functionally a difference, but what I will say, and I, I saw this great quote from uh, Jim Carrey, who's a comedian, and he, he quit his Facebook account. And he said that basically Facebook has allowed uh, other countries to have a bridge into our country and to, you know, wage war on us. In the past, geographically, we had the ocean surrounding us. We had a tremendous natural resources. We had great advantages. To protecting ourselves. In this case, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, they built these bridges all around the world that people can just walk, walk right in without a passport or any kind of vetting, and they can do horrible things to us, including helping uh, the, the people in like St. Pe Petersburg or wherever. They can uh, be tricked into believing something that's not true. And, and I encourage anybody out there to look into these Russian troll operations. They're very, very dirty, very sneaky, and uh, very disturbing uh, when you consider about what kind of damage they can do. And it's not a stretch to say these, these are acts of war. Would you build a wall? Would you build a wall, or, or, you know, a, 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 an internet wall such as the way China has? I, I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. That's a good question. Uh, I think there are lots of uh, avenues that these social media companies can take, though, in terms of what kind of content circulates on their platform and what doesn't. And really, it gets back to my earlier argument that these are publishers. Facebook is a publisher. They need to be responsible for what they publish, just like every other publisher. The New York Times has to be responsible for what they publish. Twitter has to be responsible for what it publishes. 
and if not, they need if they are irresponsible, then they need to be uh, punished like other other publications would be. So I think it's a loophole in the law, and uh, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, move them into the camp of publishers, and I think you'd see a lot she different amount of dis lots of different discourse on there than you see now. As soon as it has to be vetted. I agree absolutely. Yeah, Brent Obergaard, thank you so much for coming down. Thank you. Always thank great you. to talk yeah. with you. Me too. Me Next too. time okay. soon. <laughs> okay. Bye -bye.